Liverpool Football Club are league champions once again after a 30-year wait and Reds fans on Merseyside and around the world are going to enjoy this moment. Joining me on this first part of the show to reflect on that title triumph is Stephen Warnock, a former Liverpool player, Dominic King, a journalist who's written about the fortunes of the club for the best part of the last 20 years, and Andy Heaton from the Anfield Wrap, who's a lifelong supporter. Guys, great to see you all today. Andy, if I could start with you, I think the, the question that I've been asked more than any in the few weeks it's been since Liverpool were confirmed as champions is why? Why does this league title mean so mm. much to Liverpool support? What would you say to that? Well, I, mean, I think it's the weight. I don't think anyone could have envisioned if you would have said 30 years ago, you know, it'd, it'd be 30 years till the next one. I've been watching VTs of Kenny Daglish when he's saying, oh, we need to start again already. You know, the whole run, running man attitude towards, you know, we go again. And it's, it, it, I, I think the league title, this one, it signifies not the end of a journey, but it signifies how far we've come under the current manager and that, you know, we are back on our infamous perches, Vegas and there. Put it a couple of years ago. And the, the European Cups were always, Fantastic. I know I have to take away, you know, Madrid last year or 2005, but, you know, I think it's been said over and over again that the league title is your bread and butter. And I think, especially having been ran so hard by Man City last year and, and not got over the line to do it in the current circumstances and, and so magnificently with such a big gap, it, it's, it's brilliant. It, it, feels, it feels generational. It feels like it's ours and, and our kids, whereas, you know, 30 years, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible gap. Stephen, when you were at the club, did you always feel that there was a, a real expectation and a pressure because of the history of the football club to, 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 to win the title, to almost get that monkey off the back? Yeah, I think you always feel that. I think even when I grew up sort of supporting the team and ever since I've come back to the club, working for the club as well, there's always the feeling around the city that, this could be our year. This could be the year. And I think even as players, you feel that. Um, I think when I was sort of in and around the team, because I was a local lad as well, there was that sort of pressure on you to try and try and win the title. And obviously, you had Stephen as captain, who, who probably felt it more so than anyone because he was so desperate to deliver it. So, yeah, I think there's, there's always that feeling of that. I think there's elements now where I think the players have sort of moved out of the city where they're living as well to take that pressure off themselves as well you see a lot of the players living in either Manchester or Formby way not in the city centre or in and around it and I think that's part of the reason why they've actually taken that pressure off themselves as well and Dom you know you've been there all the way watching from that very first game at Anfield against Norwich City did you get a feeling a vibe in the early stages of the season that this was going to be a, a special year for Liverpool I did. I, the game that really did it for me was Burnley away. Um, I just remember the players coming out that night. They'd won 3 0 and they played brilliant. And that game could have been 5 or 6 0. They absolutely ransacked Burnley that night. Um, and where we, where we congregate after the game to see the players, and you'll know yourself, Matt, that little corridor um, that goes out to where the team coaches. I just remember seeing them and they, they looked not like they'd been beaten, but it was like, that game's done. We're on to the next one now. Forget about this. Three points next week. We go, we go. And they were just sort of, they were relentless. Every time you sort of spoke to them about the near miss of last year, uh, about Madrid, they didn't want to talk about Madrid. Nobody was interested about Madrid. It was like, that's, that, that's finished. Every time you spoke to them about um, going so close about Man City, not bothered about that. We're, we're thinking about this season. And they were just absolutely um, unstoppable. And, you know, they basically had the league won by the middle of November. That's how, you know, they were so dynamic and put so much, and made such a statement early on. You know, I think everybody just thought they knew they were like a runaway horse. Yeah, Stephen, uh, Don there mentioned about, you know, no talk about last season and, and running Man City so close. But from a player's perspective, that must have been hard for the, the team to bounce back from, getting 97 points doing so well, losing just one game last season and yet not winning the league. To, to, to carry that on and, and ignore it and, and, and go on to win the league this year has just been a, a huge feat. Yeah, but I, I think when you, you think back to the final in Kiev and the players were distraught at losing against Real Madrid in Kiev, and the idea from that was to learn from it, to bounce back as, as well as you can and, and make sure that the next season's not a, um, a bad season. You only look at Tottenham this season and what's happened to them. 
to bounce, they haven't bounced back from the Champions League final at all. Hugo Lloris did an interview where he openly said, we've suffered mentally from that game. We haven't recovered from it at all. Whereas Liverpool were almost like, it was like, okay, we've lost that, but we're not going to lose it again. And we're not going to, that's, that's a sign of, of, of mentality, uh, a great sign of, of mental strength to, to overcome that. And I think that's what Jurgen Klopp tried to instill into the players. And the other thing that was really impressive to me this season was the fact that the players came back in pre-season and there was this euphoria around the European Cup getting paraded everywhere. And Jurgen Klopp got so annoyed at it. He said, it has to stop. This cannot go round anymore. We can't take this anywhere else because that's in the past. That's now our history. And we want to win the Premier League or we want to retain the European Cup. And that was the mentality of Jurgen Klopp, putting that into the players. And I think the players one day suddenly just went, do you know what? You're absolutely right. We can't live on that, that glory of that Cup next season. That's not going to win us anything. We've got to reset, refocus. And I think they were, they were unbelievable the way they did that. Yeah, well, Stephen mentioned him there and there can be no doubt that one man has been integral to this success of Liverpool both this season and in recent years, a certain Jürgen Norbert Klopp. He's a perfect fit as a Liverpool manager. They love him. They love him. I mean, they love Benitez, but as far as he's concerned, no, Klopp's here now. Klopp's getting, he's up there with Shankly, Bob Paisley, I'm pretty sure of it, as far as Liverpool fans are concerned. We've had great managers since Kenny won the thing. Now, no, we've been fantastic managers, but they haven't uh, achieved the Holy Grail, you know, and this is the Holy Grail. So we, whoever was going to do that was going to go <coughs> down the likes of, you know, Shankly, Paisley, Douglas, and he, he deserves so because it's been so long, you know, 30 years. He gets Liverpool, um, and Liverpool get him. Liverpool have bought into everything he's doing because for the first two years his record wasn't better than Brendan's but, but the fans gave him the power to drop players, to pick players, to do whatever he wanted and they supported him and he can see the outcome of that. Now when Brendan was here and, and it didn't win we would blame him and say he's playing the wrong team and we would boom and we criticise him which then affects the team because the players then see he hasn't got the power whereas now the players know if, if he drops Salah the fans aren't going to boo him, so they'd support him. And the only two teams in the country that gives the manager that power are Manchester City and Liverpool. This is why they're the two best teams. Liverpool haven't got better players than Manchester United necessarily or Arsenal or Tottenham, but the harmony, the togetherness, the belief and the trust in the manager is there, which means we, we produce what we do. Logan last year finished second. He could have won it because, I mean, in fairness, finishing with 97 points, only one defeat. Uh, I think they deserve it as well as probably deserve it uh, Manchester City on the day. But he finished second. I mean, uh, before him, Brendan Rodgers finished second one. Um, Rafael Benitez finished second. We finished second as well. So that means at some time, it, we knew it, it was going to come. But come that way, come with uh, style and, uh, and the panache of, about it is fantastic. Yeah. Dom, you've probably had more dealings with him directly than any of us, I suppose, in terms of the press conferences and the amount of time you've got to spend with uh, spend with Jurgen Klopp. How is he different to the other managers you've experienced at Liverpool, the likes of Julier, Rafa Benitez, even Brendan Rodgers? What makes him different and special? Um, good question. Uh, I think it's important to sort of say um, there's a very fine line um, with him. There's a very, very, sorry, not a fine line, a clear line in terms of he's the manager, we deal with him. He's never sort of, there's no um, uh, friendly nature. That he, he's, not, he's never called any of us by our first names in, in five years that he's been here. Certain other managers in the past did that. You know, we'd make a point of referencing you in press conferences. Um, there's not, so there's no familiarity. You know exactly where you are. Um, he, he doesn't do anything for show. It's it, what he says is what he means. Um, he he doesn't like um, he doesn't like the questions where he wants he, he won't criticise anyone. He's not he, he's a man who's very respectful of people. Um, so you know <clears throat> he, he, he likes things done properly. Um, he's just I, he's just got a charisma about him. You just sort of you know he's in the room. Where, um, you, you know he he has this sort of way of speaking to you where. Um, it's just very formal and you know exactly that he's a man. Every time you're with him, you know he's a man in control of what he's doing. 
Stephen, would you say perhaps his greatest strength or his greatest asset has been the fact that he seems to have got the whole team with him and behind him? You've been in many dressing rooms at, at plenty of different teams and it, it's fair to say there's often one or two that don't buy the manager, they're not playing, they, they may be a bit disruptive, but it doesn't seem that at Liverpool at all. No, there doesn't. And I think that comes from not only the manager, but I think it comes from the senior players. He puts a lot of trust in, in Jordan Henderson and James Milner, Adam Lallana, and obviously Virgil van Dijk now coming in. And I think Jeannie Wijnaldum to a certain degree. And I think those senior players are always the ones that, when new lads come into the changing rooms, they're the ones that sort of set the, the mark as to what's expected within the changing room, what you can and what, what to what's acceptable really and what's not. Um, and I think that's something that Jurgen Klopp's done very well. I think if, I, I can imagine him being the type where if you stepped out of line with your captain or with one of the senior players, then Jurgen Klopp stood two metres behind thinking, I'll, I'll back him up. That's the type of manager he is, not the type that I'd sort of, sort of just sort of leave it to the captain and if someone said something disrespectful to the captain, that he'd stand aside and then sort of, a month or two months down the line to try and sell him or get him out the team or something along them lines. I think the, the great thing that I see from the outside looking in is that if there's ever an issue within the changing room or on the pitch where a player comes off and he shakes his head, it's dealt with there and then. There's no sort of period of time where it's left to fester and the player's thinking, oh, what's this going to be like? I think you just know where you stand with the manager. Yeah, it's been a huge benefit and a huge asset, as I said, to Liverpool. Two of their uh, former greats, Reds legends, John Barnes and Ian Rush, will be as delighted as anybody that this long wait for the league title is over. They believe it's the club and the team's mentality and identity that have been key. I think Liverpool this year, going out, know when they're going to win. Where before, I think maybe we might win, we might not win, but I think it's all the mentality, it's a mental toughness. To be successful in everything you do, you need to be mentally tough, and uh, I think that's what uh, this Liverpool squad have got. Now, the mental toughness is, uh, is so strong that uh, I can actually, you can go as far as say, is I think Liverpool could have played better last year and they've not won the league. And they've won games where they haven't been fantastic. This year, they have well, they have up until Christmas and all that. Where some games where they haven't played well, but they won. Where two or three years ago, they were playing well and getting beat. Liverpool now have an identity, a, 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 a clearly defined and identifiable identity. Meaning, if you were to look at a, a screen of a football game and you don't know who's playing. All the players are blacked out in terms of you can't see their faces, you can't see the colour, you can't see the kit. And you see a team playing, you can go, that's Liverpool. You can go, that's Manchester City. You can't say that about any other team because any other team just plays and they've got good players and good players win games. But they have a clearly defined way of playing which suits the players as do Manchester City. And that is why they are the best team. So the thoughts there of Reds legends John Barnes and Ian Rush. Andy, you know, it's been 30 years. There's sort of many times, I guess, you thought you were close and you, you could have won it, but when during this season did you think, finally, I'm confident it's our title? When did, when did, would I admit it publicly or when did I admit, when, when did I think it myself to completely? In your own head, because I know you'd never admit it publicly, you'd be too nervous to do that. Um, no, I think for everyone, it was Man United uh, when Mo Salah scored in the manner in which the game went as well. It was 19 minutes, like the genie, the, the cork come off the champagne, the genie come off the bottle, however you want to put it. And it's the first time you heard with, under Jürgen's reign we're going to win the league but for me I, I to be honest I'll go back to either Leicester uh, Leicester on Boxing Day I thought it was a potential banana skin Leicester was still in contention if you look at the table back then and they just blew them away just blew them away and that's when I thought right okay this is us but I was fairly sure something to be done again I get ridiculous how early it was the Villa game when Sadio scored that header um because it, it was just it had any ex everything was on them that day, and they proved that. And I thought if they can come through that, they can do anything. And you know, it was fantastic. So yeah, so there, there's three different answers for you, my three different <laughs> answers. But I'm going to settle on Man United at home. I mean, Dom, there has been that never say die attitude, which I think has been around for a couple of years, but has never been perhaps more true than in the last 12 months. Andy mentioned a few of the games there. I remember one at Sheffield United where they were lucky to get through as well with Ronaldo scoring one through. 
through Henderson's legs and Andy, I think, was dancing around in the background of that shot, I seem to remember as well. But where, where do you think that, that comes from, that, that never-say-die attitude that they've been able to show on so many occasions, winning quite a few games just by the odd goal? Um, there's a great story. Um, well, it, last year, I think you, I don't think you can underestimate the impact of, um, of the Barcelona game in terms of turning that around and the, the ramifications that that had. Um, but there's a great story from pre-season um, when they were in Evian um, and Klopp brought a, a, a world champion high wave surfing from Germany, Sebastian Stoudner. And he, he talked to the players about mind over matter and get it. it um, it was all about uh, the talk you did with them was all about sort of controlling your emotions in the, in the, the points when you think all is lost or all is very difficult. And he did this exercise with them where he took them in the pool and asked, them, asked the players to put their heads under water. And some of them, it was like 30 seconds coming up, sputtering for air. And he basically meditated with them. And he said, when you're in the, in the water, think of your feet, think of your toes, think of your arms, uh, relax. And by the end of it, some of them had got that good at switching themselves off um, Dejan Lovren and Adam Lallana the two they managed to get close to five minutes underwater and I spoke to Andy Robertson about this not so long ago and I asked him about it I said you know sub subconsciously do you think that helped you in, in the early stages and he said you know probably it probably did because he, he used the word about um, your, your, your mind can do some wonderful things but it can also do some horrible things and if you control yourself in the points when it's difficult you've got a much better chance of succeeding now, if you look back at October, where they went Leicester, Man United, uh, Tottenham, and Aston Villa, Manchester City, there was four goals, won games in the last five minutes. Now, it's not, I don't think that's a coincidence. I, I genuinely don't think it's a coincidence. The way Klopp sort of looks at um, every sort of minor detail, everything, the throwing coach, you know, the... the the players getting um, massages on the way back from Qatar after the World Club Championship to keep, you know, to to ensure they were ready for for Boxing Day. All these little things, um, the attention to detail that he's paid has, has has put Liverpool in this position, and there's no way you can you can sort of underestimate it. Stephen, is there a player? I mean, Liverpool have had a few injuries. They've put, they've been you know okay, but a few injuries throughout the season. But is there a player you think they couldn't have won this league without? Is there one name that you think's been integral, or has it been a complete team effort in your opinion? No, I think it's been complete team effort. I think um, they all understand the system so well. I think if you take certain players out the system, it doesn't run as well. I think we saw that uh, in the derby when we came back from the pandemic, and you sort of you're missing. Robertson and you're missing Salah and that takes away from both Mane's game and Trent Alexander-Arnold's game um, but when you're trying to pin a name down and everyone talks about Jordan Henderson and you think yeah Jordan was, was fun. He's, he's had an incredible season but then you look at Sadio Mane and when, when it's not quite worked in certain games he's been the guy, the guy who's carried the team on his shoulders sometimes and made the unthinkable happen And but then you go down the other end and I think it's the relationship between Joe Gomez and Virgil van Dijk is, is something that is just colossal. And you think how, how these two play together is, is so strong. And you think of some of the saves that Alisson's made and you think of the impact that he's had. Would Liverpool have won the league without Alisson? I don't think they would have. I think if you had a, a keeper who wasn't at that level, I don't think you win in the league. I think the amount of points that he saved um, from teams going through. I, I mean, the, the one game I remember more so than any was, and you, you'll probably laugh at it when I say it, is Southampton at home. Liverpool won the game 4-0, but they had about three one-on-ones in the first half. Mm -hmm. Alisson kept them in the game. And if he, if he doesn't, and suddenly you, you're going goals down at Anfield, it's tough to come back from. Um, so I look at things like that and you just think um, it's, it's a, a real collective effort. And you're talking about the manager there as well. And we all single-handedly praise Jurgen Klopp, but what the big thing for me Jurgen Klopp's done is he keeps on refreshing his backroom staff. So there isn't just the same voices constantly going over. And it's also, you think of Jurgen Klopp when he came into the club, he sort of came in and he says, uh, we're going to play heavy metal football. They don't play that anymore. They play a more conservative 
approach to football and, and the way that they play. So Jurgen Klopp's adapted himself to the league as well and, and changed his managerial sort of outlook hugely. Yeah, well, it's certainly been a, a season and a year that no Liverpool fan will forget in a hurry. To Stephen, to Dom and to Andy, many thanks to all of you for joining me. Plenty more to come as well after this short break. Welcome back. Liverpool are English League champions once again after a 30-year wait. But just how and why has it taken a club of such a rich history and tradition so long to get back to the top of the tree? Well, going to me to try and help answer that question are Gary Gillespie, a former Reds defender, and Steve Hobbesaw, who's a radio commentator. These two men have seen plenty of ups and downs over the last three decades. Gary, if I come to you first, just on your initial reaction, I suppose, to winning that title, confirmed a few weeks ago now, but I suppose it's a monkey off the back and must just be relief all round. Yeah, I think um, relief over, you know, enjoyment, uh, ecstatic. I mean, it's been a long time coming, uh, but I think relief, I mean, it's probably not the ideal way that we have chose to win it, and especially in the circumstances we find ourselves in. Uh, at this moment in time. But the achievement, I think you can't take anything away from it, this, this team and the achievement that they've had. It's a disappointment, obviously, that the fans can't really go out and celebrate how we would like to, to celebrate, but I'm sure that will come further down the line. But the achievement itself over the last, well, probably three seasons, really, when you think about the defeat in the, the Champions League against Real Madrid, next season winning the Champions League and coming ever so close against a Manchester uh, City side that were so strong, and obviously this season, um, I take nothing away from this squad and this manager. It really has been unbelievable. And Steve, the emotions for you as somebody that's commentated on Liverpool for such a, a long time now and seen, as I said, so many ups and downs to finally get over the line. What, mm. what are your emotions at the moment? I think it's relief more than anything. I mean, you know, I've worked in, uh, in parallel with Gary broadcasting for the last two decades and seeing the near misses. And Liverpool have been defined by sort of boom and bust over those couple of decades. So if you think of 2002 and a brilliant season for Gerard Houllier, the next season was nowhere near it, was it? I think they went to 64 points after securing 80-something in that season. It was similar for Rafa Benitez, of course, in, in 2009. They simply couldn't follow one season up with a strong season the next one after. Brendan Rodgers had it, of course, and Luis Suarez left. Um, and that followed with a season that just didn't match. So to finally get to this point, I think until they'd clinched it, I didn't quite believe it because there's been so many of those near misses. And so many times we've seen it and thought, surely they'll build on what they've done the last season. And finally they have. And it has just been sensational to watch, hasn't it? Yeah, I think the style that they've done it in, Gary, has made it even more special. It hasn't been, well, it almost hasn't been in doubt since maybe Christmas time. Yeah, I think to, to think that we're so many points ahead of a Manchester City side that we're getting deemed as probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest Premier League side uh, in history. So I think that just shows you the achievement that they've actually managed to have this season. Uh, and it's been done in style as well, built in solid defence. But I think when you look at the, the star players in, the, in this team, the likes of like, the Mannies, the likes of the Salas, the likes of the Firminos, I think that's where lies the, the quality uh, and when you've got players of that standard and capability, just nabbing your goal whenever you're under a little bit of pressure, I think that's the stuff that's made the champions. And Liverpool have got players like that in abundance. And big characters as well. I think big shout out to Jordan Henderson as well, whose Liverpool career for, for a few years was in doubt. But certainly, he'll probably go down as one of the, the greatest captains in, in, in Liverpool's history, along with the likes of you know uh, Tommy Smith, Erling Hughes, Alan Hansen. People like that. And when you're held in a steam like that, I think you're, you're, you're very good company. But it's been fantastic. Yeah, the Liverpool fans certainly going to enjoy this moment. But there can be little doubt that this title has been 30 years in the waiting. Liverpool, for a prolonged period, were exceptionally successful. They were just brilliant. They were so professional. They were so good. I mean, they were unbelievably good players. Those teams of the 80s were, were outstanding. So uh, myself as a United player during that year, it was, it was a bit daunting going up against them because they knew how to get things done. Yeah, I was brought in 1980, so uh, 
ever since I was at Liverpool, we used to winning trophies. And, uh, it's and only, the league? Yeah. Virtually every oh, year? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah sorry, we played in the 80s, won it six times. When we won the title in 1990, we didn't think, oh, we've got to make sure that because this could be the next 30 years. We fully expected to win it the next year. I don't think anybody thought that Liverpool would go so long again without uh, winning the league. The mindset of Liverpool had to change with the Premier League starting. The old Liverpool guard uh, diminished and, and, and exited the club. And that long-standing Bible they had on how to follow success at Liverpool uh, got broken up. I think they took their eye off the ball. I think whoever owned them, whoever was making decisions, thought we're Liverpool and we'll just keep going. Fergie's well uh, documented by saying he needed to knock them off their perch and eventually he did. When Graham took over, you know, Graham had just come from Rangers. Uh, he won the league easily in Rangers and uh, you know, I think he's um, maybe tried to change things too quickly when he first came. I think if you asked him that, he'd most probably tell you that as well. He saw it needed changing, he tried to implement the changes, but I think, and he might agree with me, I think he tried to do everything too quickly. Roy came over and then Roy was trying to go back to the, um, the old school again. You know, like when Ronnie was there, you know, Ronnie and that, and try and, but Roy was maybe a little bit too nice. It got to the stage between 94 and 97 when people were getting excited in March because we're playing good football and we're only a few points off the top. And I always felt we will fall away because we didn't have that mentality, um, that discipline to, to grind results out. Did you arrive with a real genuine belief that you could win the league for this football club? No, not really, because we had to rebuild the team and we need uh, some years. They did give us a, a good battle one year um, they're always a massive rival, but they, they weren't really title rivals as such, maybe one season. And um, um, I think then that summer they had a few interesting transfers that they didn't build on finishing second place and challenging us, and they almost went backwards again. Brendan was close, um, the closest it's been for many years, and should have won it. To get to the pinnacle and be so close was, was a great achievement. And, and like I said, if, you know, if we had the investment, then it might, have been, it might have been different. I never, ever believed, ever believed, that I'd be sitting here 30 years of the Premier League and Liverpool hadn't won it. Steve, you mentioned it earlier, but when you go through it, 1991, 2002, 2009, 2014, Liverpool have finished second and then failed to build on that coming so close and, and they have really dropped off in the, the following year. And I guess that's the lesson the club has to learn. I mean, you know, you were there through many of those. Why do you think those drop-offs occurred? Lack of investment? There were so many different reasons and different managers will, will pinpoint different elements, of course. For Gerard Houllier, he had health problems. Rafa Benitez will cite civil war in the boardroom and maybe a lack of finance. You know, we, we constantly heard that message from Rafa Benitez that perhaps the money wasn't there, the outlay wasn't there to take them to the very top. Um, Brendan Rodgers might look at the departure of, of Luis Suarez. But I think what's interesting about this current regime, if you can call them that, and particularly the manager is, he's thrived on perhaps the disappointments they've suffered. He's, he's built on disappointments and he's not allowed the club to, to stand still. And I, I mentioned that boom and bust phrase before, whereas there's been big peaks from some of those other managers and they've dropped off the cliff edge. Um, Jurgen Klopp has used every one of those disappointments to actually take the club further. And I think ultimately you have to put a lot of this at the feet of Jurgen Klopp. It was a phenomenal signing to get him in. Of course, several... Finals he reached with the football club that didn't produce the results the fans would have wanted, but he kept going. And of course, the disappointment in Kiev, so close, but then follows it up a year later with um, you know a, a win in the Champions League. And now, of course, Premier League winners. And I, I think you do have to look at Jurgen and say, he has probably made the biggest difference to this football club since Bill Shankly in terms of the impact that he's had on Liverpool. I, th I think it's that big. Gary, how has it been for you? Obviously, you won, I think, three league titles with the club during your time at Liverpool. But 
But since 1990, nothing until, until this year. So how's it been for you as a former player and a former player in such a successful team, looking on for so many years and seeing them, well, not really on too many occasions, look like winning the title? No, I think it's been, it's been a shock in, in many ways. I think I left the football club in 1991 where, again, we'd come second. Uh, and to think that we wouldn't have gone on and, and been a major force and challenging on a regular basis for league titles, uh, I would never have believed anybody that had, had said that to me. But I, just, I think it just shows you how far you can actually slip. Um, and we certainly slipped a long way. I think the difference, I think, when you're talking about these sides that have came, come second in, in past seasons, I think when you look at this side as well, there's not too many players I don't think would want to leave Liverpool at this moment in time. I think everything is in place. Mm. I, I think Steve, Steve made reference to like having the manager. The manager has done a, a remarkable job. But recruitment is good as well. I think we've bought at the right time. We've bought the right players. And all credit to the owners as well. I think when you look off the, the field, the new stadium, the new stand, or I say the new stadium, obviously I mean the new stand. The training ground is going to get developed very shortly as well. Um, everything just seems to be really hunky-dory at this moment in time in Liverpool. Uh, and I can't see it being another 30 years before we win the next league title. I think this squad is too good. The capability is there for them to, I wouldn't say dominate the Premier League, because I don't think any team will dominate Premier League football uh, in this era. But I certainly think this won't be the last league title that Liverpool will get. And it certainly won't be 30 years before the next one. Yeah, well, that's what all... Liverpool fans will be keeping their fingers crossed for, no doubt about that. Uh, recently, I caught up with Sammy Hippie, a former Liverpool captain, of course, to get his thoughts on where perhaps the title has evaded the Reds over recent time. I think the club has done now what uh, maybe what uh, what United did as, at our time, that uh, that they they had they knew precise which position they need to play, and then they 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 took a quality one that they they paid a lot of money money for and. And my time, then I can't say it's wrong doing that. That, that the, the, the squad changed every year or every summer quite a lot. That there was a lot of players who who left and a lot of players to come. And and, and gelling is is not that easy always. That that when new players are coming, you have to adapt to to their culture or, or how they are as a person and and of course uh, how they play. And, and that's not always. Uh, 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 very easy and, and better is that you you have the the core actually and then you add quality to that core what what Liverpool has done now and and uh, I think that's that's the way to to go forward as well. Gary would you say the players over the last 30 years have been good enough I mean you think about Sammy Hippier that we just heard from there Steven Gerrard, Xabi Alonso, Luis Suarez, Fernando Torres there's been some wonderful players at Liverpool so it's hard to believe that they haven't managed to win the title when you, you think of the talent that's been at manager's disposal. Well, absolutely. I think you, the, the players that you mentioned are such great individual players. Um, I think your heart goes out maybe a little bit to the likes of Steven Gerrard, who for like years and years and years had to carry uh, Liverpool. Um, uh, and missing out on a, a Premier League title is obviously something that uh, is disappointing to him. But what a fantastic career he's had. And I think when you look at the individuals, but it's about the full package. It's about being solid in the boardroom. It's about having the, the right recruitment for to bring in the next generation. Um, and I think at this, at this moment in time, as I said before, I think that's where Liverpool are at this moment. Uh, moment. I don't think that has been the case over the last uh, 30 years. Yes, they've had great teams and they've had great individual players, but it, there's just been something lacking that really makes the, the, the icing on the cake. But uh, as I said, um, I think this team certainly do have that and the capability is, is there to, to go and, and be a real major force and become uh, and make their own history and become real Liverpool legends because let's face it, I think you have to do it on a, a, a longer period than maybe just one or two, two uh, trophies uh, but I think the capability is certainly there for them. Just finally Steve, uh, it's all about a journey of course and Liverpool have reached the top of the mountain by by winning this league title. There's been some great highs along the way. You think of Istanbul and that Champions League final last year as well. From your point of view as a, as a commentator over the years, what was the lowest moment? What was the moment you really thought or you felt dejected by what you were seeing at Liverpool? I think that's a really easy answer because if you think back to 2010 and FSG had just bought the football club and their first game in charge was the infamous Merseyside derby. 
Everton to Liverpool nil. And I remember standing in the bowels of Goodison Park and Roy Hodgson had come in to talk through the game and he described it as one of the best derby performances he'd ever seen, much to the bemusement of the press. And there was players like Christian Paulson and Paul Koncheski in the, in the Liverpool side. And it was a Liverpool side that, that didn't fit the image of the football club. And I think reflecting on that now and thinking of the 10-year journey that FSG have taken with the football club, the difference is, is utterly remarkable. I mean, people will perhaps point to different lows, but I think, and maybe it's a bit unfair to point the finger at, at Roy Hodgson. You know, he had half a year at the football club. He did brilliantly in other jobs and into Milan and, and Fulham. He just perhaps wasn't the right fit for Liverpool. And I think at that time, the club was a little bit rudderless. And it's remarkable to think how the decade has, um, has carried itself out since that point. Yeah, such a, a huge shift and a huge change. Uh, to Gary and to Steve, my thanks uh, for joining me today. Really appreciate your time and hearing your thoughts. Always good to see you both. As ever, don't forget more to come after this short break. Welcome back to the third and final part of the show, reflecting on Liverpool's title triumph. It's been a long time in the waiting, but you think now that Jurgen Klopp's side have won the European Cup, the World Club Championship, and now the Domestic League, all in the space of a little over 12 months. So what's next? Well, here to try and help answer that question is the respected uh, journalist from The Athletic, James Pearce and lifelong Red supporter, Mo Stewart. Mo, I'll go to you first because mm. we'll talk about what's next and what's to come and how Liverpool can maybe sustain this in a moment. But your, your emotions, first of all, on that moment a few weeks ago now when it was announced that Liverpool were league champions once again. How, how did it feel? It, it's hard to think of the future. I'm still very much living in the now. Uh, it's, it's, it's very strange. I mean... How do you feel when you get that thing that you've always wanted? It, it, there is a lot of kind of relief that this team has deserved this for the last couple of years. They've been growing for even longer than that. And they've been unlucky in so many times. And you do just wonder if it's going to be a, a story of us just being not quite good enough. But then the way we've been able to come out this season has put all of those things to doubt. And to just be able to have that underlying saying, yes, we are the champions. This team is the best in England, in Europe and in the world. James, we just spoke to Steve Hollisall earlier in the show. Who I asked him what he thought was the lowest moment in his time um, commentating and reporting on Liverpool. And, and he mentioned the, the derby, the Goodison derby of of 2010 when, of course, Roy Hodgson came out and said it was, a, it was one of the best derby performances of all time. You know, you've been reporting on Liverpool now for a long time yourself. That journey, even in the last 10 years, has been remarkable, really, for now them to reach this point. Oh, it really has, yeah. I think I don't think it, I don't think it, it got any worse than that Merseyside derby in October 2010. I think not, not just in terms of on the pitch, but off it as well, when you think that that was a club that was that had been on the brink of administration. You know, FSG had just bought it, and I think even for the owners, they, you know, it, it was just really registering with them the size of the challenge they'd taken on. I don't think, you know, I think John Henry and Tom Warren have, have spoken in depth about it. That you know, it was only once they'd actually got their foot in the door that they, you know, they, it really opened their eyes to 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 what a huge task it would be to to turn it around and. Yeah, you know, Liverpool were only off the bottom of the Premier League table on goal difference after that defeat to Everton. Um, you know, a manager that was out of his depth, a, a playing staff that was in desperate need of, of overhaul and, you know, a, a club that wasn't punching its weight off the pitch either, you know, commercially. And, of course, the, the massive stadium dilemma as well that, that they've been wrestling with for years. So it has been a, a remarkable journey in those in those 10 years since. And even, even when you think back to when Klopp arrived in 2015, you know, the... The, the target really back then was, can he get Liverpool back into the Champions League? You know, that was that was in itself a challenge to try and make Liverpool a regular top four team again. You know, actually winning the competition and winning the Premier League still still felt like a, you know, a long way off. Yeah, well, of course, he finally got round to what he's looking to achieve for all those years, success in the English uh, league title. Uh, confirmed, of course, back on the... 25th of June, when Manchester City lost away at Stamford Bridge to Chelsea. It was a night that no Liverpool fan will forget. But remarkably, at that stage, 
It had been more than three years since Liverpool had lost a league game at Anfield, the last opposition manager to win at the famous old ground, a certain Sam Allardyce. So how did he do it? There's not a lot of weaknesses, may I add, um, but the, there's, there's one area that needs to be exploited because Liverpool attack and use the high press system and they allow the fullbacks to push right on is the ability to play quality balls down the side of the two centre halves or in behind down the side of the two centre halves and um, you've got to get the right runners making the right runs and um, and then of course you've got to have the opportunity to put the ball in the back of the net because you get so few chances against Liverpool that you must take them when you get them and in our case when we won there with Palace um, uh, Christian Benteke who was spending his first year at Palace having been transferred from Liverpool was the was the man who scored both goals, so uh, we were very pleased. Well, Sam Allardyce certainly enjoyed that moment, which is a while ago now, but James, did you get the feeling, perhaps on that day or in the subsequent months after that, that, that something changed? Because Liverpool had been famously inconsistent at Anfield, really, for many years. For them not to have lost a league game at Anfield for more than three years it is, again, such a turnaround. Yeah, it's an, it's an absolute fortress, isn't it? And I think... The, the single biggest driver in, in changing that around is Jurgen Klopp because I think you know it was I always think back to that defeat defeat very early on in his reign against Crystal Palace when he Klopp famously said he felt very alone at the sight of fans leaving early and and that, that was that was tended to be the mood back then it was almost like well if if Liverpool go behind they won't come back you know there's 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 no points you know might as well beat the traffic because um, you know they almost like players resigned to their fate and, and fans resigned to it as well. And, um, you know, Klopp obviously famously said he, his mission was to try and turn doubters into believers. And, you know, that is perfectly illustrated by, by what's happened with the, the home form. You think of when he was mocked after the draw against West Brom, when, when he had the players holding hands in front of the cop and people were saying, you know, why are they celebrating the, getting a point against a, a mid table team? But it wasn't, it was Klopp saying, I think it was Origi that scored a very late equaliser that day. That was him saying, this is what you can do if you stick with us. If we're all united as one, we can actually be a really powerful force. And, and you know, of, of course, bringing in top class players has helped. But yeah, the atmosphere at Anfield has, has absolutely you know, been, been transformed. When, you know, from, a, from a time when you almost felt that the expectation levels weighed heavily on players' shoulders to the point certainly in the last three years, where it's just a source of absolute inspiration and what Liverpool achieved against Barcelona in that, in that Champions League semi-final was the, the perfect illustration of the power of Anfield. It, Mo, it must be a pleasure to go back to Anfield again now. You, you, as a home supporter, you almost go there, certainly for a league game, not hoping to win, expecting to win. It's almost a guarantee. It's been fantastic. The way this Liverpool team have been able to grow into games as well and to be able to get better as late on and score so many late clinching goals. I put all that down to Klopp as well and harnessing that power of the crowd. Because as James said, we've had managers in the past who have paid lip service to the power of Anfield and to the power of the crowd. Klopp put his money where his mouth is essentially and he showed us exactly what we can do. And that kind of combination of our power and his power on the pitch has become a real potent mix now. So even at times, like I say, when we haven't been performing well, pre-lockdown, the game against West Ham is a really good example. That was a Liverpool team who never really got to the highest of their level. But through sheer will, determination and bloody mindedness, they were able to get another win. And when you're a squad who can find that from anywhere, it gives you belief, it gives you strength and it gives your, takes it away from your opponents as well. Yeah, well, Liverpool, of course, have broken all sorts of records in recent times. But uh, how should this team be viewed? How should it be compared to others? And crucially, how do they now go on to dominate for years to come? The worthy champions this year and, uh, and probably capable of going on for a season or two more. They don't need to go out now and buy four players and five players ready-made for Liverpool's first team. They can get one or two here and there, spend a lot of money on them um, and continue their success.
put themselves in a position to really go and achieve something special with this group of players. They're a fantastic team, but you need a little bit longer longevity to be compared to the team I played in or the 99 team or the fact that what they achieved in one season. The 99 team obviously winning the treble and the fact that we won the league and the Champions League in one season, then win the league the next season three in a row back to other Champions League finals. I think if you look at a team, you've got to judge it over a five, six year block and see what they've achieved in that spell. And Liverpool at the beginning stages of their journey. It's more difficult, I think, to have that period of sustained success because of the, the quality of the teams that are in the Premier League now and the resources available to the top six. The, the obvious ones are always going to be able to, to go into the market, get the top players in the world and, and make them come to the Premier League. So it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to see Liverpool have that period where they, they could dominate for the next 10, 15 years. I don't see that happening, but uh, clearly they're in a fantastic period for their club. Modern football is, is about players coming and players going. And then when players come and players go, it's in the lap of the gods. I said, we're going to win again next year. So potentially, if they stay together, they can be one of the greatest Liverpools of all time. But just like Torres was going to be one of the greatest Liverpool players of all time, but he left after three years. Suarez was going to be left after three years. Coutinho was going to be. If all of a sudden this team breaks up and in 10 years' time we look back and say, yeah, they won it in 2020, but they never played it again, how can they be seen as one of the great teams? And you know, I have the impression that we won't have to wait another 30 years after that. <laughs> <laughs> you think this is the start? Yeah, I think this is the start. James, what do you believe is key for Liverpool now to build on this success and be able, not necessarily to dominate, but to, to sustain this success and, and to keep challenging? Because so many times Liverpool have come close in the past and then really dropped off and, and everyone at the club will be desperate to hope that that doesn't happen again. Yeah, I, I think the, the key thing for Klopp, which you know he'll already be on the, the players' cases on this front, will be keeping that fire burning, you know, that hunger, you know, to make sure that, yes, they've scaled heights that no Liverpool team has managed for, for 30 years. But, you know, why, why rest now? What, why, you know, there's too much still to be achieved. You know, he will want to turn this into a, a golden era for the club. And, that, you know, it's going to be difficult because I don't think it's realistic for any team to dominate English football in the way that Liverpool did back in the, certainly the 80s. But, you know, it's, you can guarantee that their rivals will come back strong at the next season. But everything is set up at Liverpool for them to, to go on and win more major trophies. You know, you look at the average age of the players, you know, the front three, I think they're all 28. You know, you look at, you look at Fabinho and his development, you look at Trent Alexander-Arnold, Virgil van Dijk, Alisson, all these players, uh, you know, have still got their peak years ahead of them. So, you know, you don't, you don't look at Liverpool's title triumph this season <clears throat> and think, you know, this is a, this is a team or a squad in, in need of major renovations or one that's you know, peaked and is now going over the edge. Because I just don't think that's the case. I think, of course, you'd like to see one or two signings added to it this summer just to give it greater depth. Um, but, you know, there, there's, there's so much to be positive about going forward because, you know, you only have to look at the way in which they responded to winning the Champions League to, to, to know that, I, you know, I, I don't think there'll be any hint of complacency creeping in. I think, if anything... The, the you know the the taste of winning the Premier League and also I think that the fact that they've had to do it without fans during the business end of the season ha has taken a little edge off it. Um, so I think they will want to go and, and do it again next season to make sure they can savour everything that um, they probably have been denied because of the circumstances surrounding this title triumph. Mo, do you think they need to go and buy? I mean, it's you know famously said in football that you need to improve when you're at the top, not when you're on the way down. But I think about Timo Werner, of course, now a Chelsea mm. player, and I think in the past many Liverpool fans would have seen the club missing out on a on a target like that and, and criticised the club and criticised the manager. It hasn't really happened on this occasion, perhaps for obvious reasons. But do you think that they need to to go out and buy more players this summer? It's it's interesting because I think Klopp definitely would have. Pre-COVID, I think that he would look to try to get one more, uh, not necessarily a star player, but an elite player who can grow into a star player. Someone who's going to raise the level of everyone already in the squad, keep that hunger ticking over, as James said. Obviously, with the way things are going financially, it looks less likely that Liverpool are going to do that. But it means that our rivals can, in theory, steal a march on us if they are willing to take the risk that we're not. I like the idea, though, of 
Klopp kind of finding signings from within. The kind of players that we've brought in over the previous years, like Kiana Herver, Seth Vandenberg, Harvey Elliott, to add to the likes of Nico Williams and Curtis Jones. These are all young players who will be expected to see more minutes in this time. They're, someone, they're players who know the system, they know the squad. There's that level of trust already within the group from them. So you have less problems of maybe bringing in someone who can upset that group. Because I think if you look at, as you mentioned, when Liverpool failed previously and Klopp's issues with Dortmund, a lot of it was the players who were there wanting to not be there anymore or there's some kind of issue within that net squad. So if we can avoid that, then I think that we're already a step ahead. And I agree with James. I don't think we're threatened with the same issues that Manchester City have seen this season where they've had burnout from having to be so consistent at such a high level again and again and again and again. I would like to see us bring in some new faces just, just to freshen it up a little bit. But if we went with the same squad as we started last season with, I still think we're the favourites to win it. Yeah, and of course, it shouldn't be forgotten that Liverpool barely recruited last summer and it didn't end up too badly. To James and to Mo and to everybody that's been involved in the show today, our thanks. It's a, a league title, a long time in the waiting. 30 years for Liverpool Football Club, but nobody at the club or its supporters intend on waiting another three decades to see a repeat performance. From all of us, thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. <laughs>